Um, this is the Rocky Flats Cold War Museum Oral History Project and the Carnegie Library Maria Rogers Oral History Project. I am Hannah Nordhaus and I'm interviewing Herb Bowman. Um, we are in Rio Ranto, New Mexico, outside of Albuquerque. And it's the 2nd of September, 2004. <laughs> um, so to get started, if you could just tell me a little bit about your background, um, where you grew up, what your parents did, schooling, how you sure. your life. Oh, yeah, I'm delighted. Uh, I grew up in uh, Grand Junction, Colorado. Actually born in uh, Detroit, Michigan, but uh, uh, at an early age of less than one year, we moved to Colorado. And uh, as as a youth, my my dad uh, was a carpenter on uh, the Moffat and then the Denver and Rio Grande Railroad. So uh, before school age, I was all over the mountains. I lived in Winter Park and Yampa and Phippsburg and places like that. Uh, uh, and then came down to Denver to uh, start kindergarten, and then we moved to Grand Junction uh, when I was in the first grade. So I uh, went to Grand Junction High, and uh, uh, at, uh, after graduation, uh, went into the Army, and by some fortuitous set of circumstances, ended up in the Manhattan Engineering Project at Los Alamos back in uh, 1946. I was born 1928. 1928, yeah. okay. Yeah, I'm an Anasazi. <laughs> <laughs> Senior citizen in New Mexico. Uh, and uh, uh, so I, I spent about two years in, in the, with the Manhattan Engineering District, which is uh, the father of uh, the atomic bomb. And you said this is when? 1946. 46. Yeah, one year after the the uh, first test in New Mexico and the, the two drops on Japan. Uh, after out of the Army, I uh, went to what is now Mesa State College in Grand Junction for uh, 18 months and uh, uh, Bachelor of Ar or, uh, I'm sorry, an associate, associate in Science degree there, and then to the University of Colorado where I got a Bachelor of Arts in Physics. Uh, at that time, uh, uh, during the senior year there, uh, we noticed in the paper there was an ad that said uh, they were interviewing for some jobs for a, a new plant that had been just announced in, what was it, March of 1951 or something like that. Uh, and uh, several of us in the physics department said, gee, this is an atomic energy plant. Uh, uh, we're we're so-called physicists. We think we'll go down and see what's going on. And uh, almost as well, almost a reason for missing one of the final tests. If you had a job interview and a final test, uh, they let you out of the final test and to go get a job interview, which was quite nice. Uh, anyway, I interviewed then uh, with some people who were uh, the original Dow people out of Middle Michigan. And uh, uh, subsequently in June, of, or actually in April of that year, uh, they, I got a job offer from Dow uh, to work at the new Project Apple, as it was called. Uh, knew nothing about it, very few people knew anything about it other than the newspaper release that had been in the Denver Post. So you did know it was an atomic energy? Yes. It was, that was an uh, energy it, we knew that it was, had something to do with atomic energy. Had no idea what, what phase. Uh, so in June of 1951, uh, I had received, well, prior to graduation I had received about four different sets of instructions from Dow as to where to report. Uh, well, one time I was uh, going to be put off a month. Uh, another time they wanted me to come to Midland, Michigan. Uh, another time they said, uh, you'll probably end up in Denver. And the last one I got is, uh, uh, you'll start at Los Alamos. So, uh, in June of uh, 1951, I reported to uh, uh, Los Alamos Group W1, uh, which was the weapons design group 
at uh, Los Alamos. And that's the first time I had any inclination whatsoever as to what we were going to be involved in. Uh, when we uh, uh, actually went to work as a doll employee at Los Alamos for about 18 months. And during that time, uh, the job there was to prepare for the first building to be completed at Rocky Flats, which was Building 91. And uh, Group uh, W1 had just built a new uh, assembly building, final, what they call final assembly building. And because of the urgency to get Rocky Flats going, we essentially had took their design and duplicated it at Rocky Flats with a few minor changes. But the building we built at uh, Rocky Flats was a building that was essentially a duplicate of uh, TA-41 in Los Alamos. And so the first year then, uh, 18 months, was at Los Alamos. Uh, in training for the final assembly operation. And then we had the job of putting together all of the specialized equipment and tools and uh, procedures and paperwork and everything that would be necessary at Rocky Flats, because we had no way of making any of that at Rocky Flats at that time, obviously. And a majority of the special tools and things were classified uh, and you needed a shop that had been cleared to do classified government work, and there weren't any of those in the Denver area, so uh, those special tools and devices were made at Los Alamos. We shipped them all up there. So in uh, 1952, uh, went back to Colorado and back to, started to work in Building 91. And so what was your specific um, job description? What were your duties? Uh, well, we were, the, we were the first operational building at, at the flats. The rest of them were under construction, but we basic, uh, they essentially completed the uh, 91 building in uh, June, July of 1991. Uh, we then started receiving components for 1951. I'm sorry about that, Hannah. All right. 91, 91. Yeah, right. Uh, it happens when you get gray hair, things happen. Uh, uh, components were being made elsewhere at Los Alamos, at Hanford, at uh, Oak Ridge. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Los Alamos was quite interested in getting out of the actual production into the business. So their motivation was to get uh, us up and running so that they could get back to their research and development. And uh, so for the first year or so, while the rest of the production facilities at Rocky Flats were being constructed and tested, uh, we operated with materials that were shipped in from uh, other production sites. And the... Uh, the job early going was to train uh, uh, the local staff uh, there in, in our operation. Uh, about, I'm going to guess, but somewhere after about the first year, somewhere during the first year there, which would have been 1952, early 1953, uh, Dow and the the uh, Department of Defense, I don't know what they were called those days, uh, and the AC entered into agreement to train military field officers who would be handling nuclear materials in the processes and procedures for handling weapons components. And so I got the assignment of setting up a training program. Uh, we had uh, classes of, of officers whose job in the field would have been to do the final assembly of weapons had there ever been a need to do that. Uh, and they came to uh, Rocky Flats for six weeks to go through a, uh, 
a specialized training program in, in handling and processing materials. So I did that for about a year. And uh, at that time, then the rest of the plant was starting to uh, produce, building 44, building 81, and building 71, was starting to produce the components that we needed in final assembly. So uh, I was given uh, an assignment to set up and, and run a production control and scheduling department for the plant. And since Building 91 was the final assembly point, uh, that responsibility fell to Building 91, and then uh, I got involved in then scheduling the rest of the plant, scheduling their production, and so that all of the components and things would arrive at one time. And, and uh, uh, it, it was an exciting business, a fun business, because uh, our, our end product, of course, uh, was essentially tur turned over to the AEC, who uh, then released the, the completed nuclear packages to the military. So part of the scheduling job was to schedule the production out of the plant into the hands of, of the military. So uh, we had a, a, a system scheduling meeting in Albuquerque once a month. And it, uh, in those days, to get to Albuquerque was not an easy task. There was a, uh, uh, I think it was Frontier Airlines, but it flew DC-3s from, from uh, Stapleton down to Albuquerque. And we stopped in, on the way we stopped in Pueblo, uh, well, Colorado Springs, Pueblo, Santa Fe, and finally got to Albuquerque. And it was, uh, you know, it was a half a day flight to get to Albuquerque from, <laughs> and in the DC-3 it never got high enough over the mountains. It used to be called the Vomit Comet because it That's flew every, every way but smooth. And having to land in all those places, <laughs> places yeah. in the summertime but, especially would be uh, But at that time we were, the, all the people in the weapon system would get together and, and uh, uh, match our, match up our production capabilities with the military's requirements and, and uh, arrange for uh, the shipments and things that was necessary to do that. It's a lot of responsibility at a pretty young age. Huh? Uh, it was fun times. It was fun times. How old were you then? When you I was probably 26, wow. 20, 25. And you were supervising all this stuff yourself? Or did you have someone supervising? Uh, I, had, uh, uh, I had a couple of schedulers worked with me. Uh, uh, I was supervisor of uh, whatever it was, uh, production control and planning supervisor, but I, uh, there were a couple of people that worked the rest of the parts of the plant. And uh, so it was, uh, as I say, it was, a, it was an interesting time because we were in throes of the Cold War and, and uh, uh, it was a very serious time, but a, a very interesting time. So from there, you, uh, uh, what was your next move? Uh, my next move was uh, I became superintendent of the assembly operation. Uh, and, and at that time, we were in the business of making a major change in the design of weapons. We were going from a system where the nuclear materials were packaged uh, separately from the rest of the bomb components so that in order to have a completed uh, nuclear weapon you needed a package of electronics and explosives and a package of nuclear materials. And uh, uh, at, at the time that I uh, uh, became responsible for the assembly operation, the designs were changing from the design people like Los Alamos in the early days of Livermore into where those were all one package now. And so this required the uh, construction, uh, the design and construction of a whole new uh, assembly operation and uh, 
plutonium fabrication facility. Uh, and uh, uh, I probably will I'll have difficulty with, with exact dates on these things because it's uh, been, the, you know, it was the last, last century all this took place. <laughs> Uh, uh, the career from my career from there uh, as uh, uh, assembly superintendent, uh, I then, and I probably may get some of these wrong. Uh, I went, uh, I was uh, given the opportunity to become the uh, administrative services manager, which uh, was a group that was responsible for uh, purchasing, accounting, uh, budgeting, had planning, uh, most of the administrative activities for the plant uh, with the exception of human re what's now called human resources. So uh, at that particular point in time uh, it was a whole new vista for me. Because what, uh, as a physicist, messing in accounting and and uh, budgeting and finance and that sort of thing was a was a whole new horizon and uh, a fun thing to do. So um, it sounds like you didn't get to use your physics much after you. I really, I I really never after left the assembly business. Uh, actually practice a lot uh, my educational profession. But that was typical with Dow. It was not unusual for Dow to Dow placed people for their capabilities, not necessarily their education. For instance, our general counsel was a chemical engineer. Oh, really? Uh, and, uh, uh, our, you know, we had uh, presidents who were chemists and and uh, so it, they really didn't look a lot at your, the, you weren't pegged by education, you were pegged by capabilities, I think, or, or uh, interests and that sort of thing. So it was, it was it, that was an exciting company to work for in the 50s and 60s. They were, the uh, management of the company was, uh, uh, some of the most enthusiastic, energetic uh, people I'd ever run into. I've never, I'd never seen people who, uh, whose enthusiasm for uh, the activities of Dow and the success of Dow and the success of the people. Uh, uh, I'd never run into them before or after that. They were just a unique group of people. Uh, I remember. We had a young president, uh, he was like in his early 40s, uh, Ted Doan, and uh, he would come to Rocky Flats. He was part of a group we called the Management Board, and he would come to Rocky Flats, and he'd leave there so excited. He said, I've never been so excited in my life. I've never, I, what you people are doing here are wonderful things. You're, you're on the edge of technology. Uh, you're leading the way. This is the kind of things that really make a great company. Uh, he was an unbelievable people person. And uh, it was sort of an unwritten rule, uh, unwritten, under, unwritten understanding that uh, if you uh, performed well with Dow, you essentially had a lifetime job. They were interested in people for careers. Uh, and they uh, went a long ways to try to promote and, and uh, uh, push that concept. So, it, uh, in, in that point in history in the in, in the company and in the, uh, we were sort of unique in the country. I think uh, most of the people I knew had been Dow all their life, and uh, all our board of directors were Dow people. Uh, it wasn't until later on that uh, they started getting outside directors, but they grew their own people, and and it was an interesting place to work. Interesting thing, time to be there. So, um, we're in administrative services now. <laughs> right, oh, sure, right. Should, uh, these, the digressions are great. Uh, no, that's fine. Yeah. Uh, Let's get through the 
Uh, I, I believe my, the, the next opportunity I was given was to set up a quality department. The, uh, uh, to go back just a little bit, uh, because there's a, sort of a flow of things through here. When, when Dow first, uh, as a matter of interest, uh, Dow did not seek out the job at Rocky Flats. The Atomic Energy Commission came to Dow and, and essentially said, we need you. And it's your responsibility as a, a citizen, a corporate citizen to uh, essentially come do this at Rocky Flats. Uh, the idea being when the AC was created, uh, a decision, a conscious decision was made, in fact, I think a little bit of it was originally written into the Atomic Energy Act of, I think, 1946, that they would uh, use private expertise to the maximum amount possible. So the AEC had people like General Electric running Hanford, and uh, I was trying to think, uh, Union Carbide at uh, Oak Ridge and at Savannah River, it was DuPont. So, uh, Dow was a natural to come because what was going to happen at Rocky Flats was, uh, besides the mechanical aspects of machining materials, there was the chemical aspects and the real uh, interesting aspect, or, or where the chemistry came in was the recovery of radioactive materials and reuse of them. So they came, they came to Dow and said, you know, we want you to uh, uh, run this plant. And at that time, back in 19, the early 1950s, the thought of uh, the AC management was that we want the private contractors to use their best management, techni their management techniques to the best of their ability. So we don't want to overburden them with regulation. So the, the uh, original contract with Dow, as I remember, was in the, like 50 pages, 50 plus pages. When I left there in 1975, we had probably 300 some pages. Uh, the reason I tell this story is because it tells about the change in philosophy that took place over the 24 years or 25 years that Dow was involved in it. It went from, now we want you to use your home office practices, to now we want you to do what we, the way we want it done. Uh, and there's a, there's a, there's a, a difference in that. Uh, and that uh, brings me up to the quality. Uh, man. Uh, people were getting more, uh, interested in the, the military was pushing for a military certification uh, concept. They said, geez, these are military weapons. We ought to certify them. And so there was a big discussion that uh, took place between the AEC, and I'll probably use the term AEC throughout when sometimes we're talking about Department of Energy and, and uh, later on. But anyway. okay. Uh, and so the, the, the uh, Department of Defense and the AEC got together and said, we'll put in, the AEC said, we'll put in a formal certification procedure. We'll put in some final inspectors uh, that will be government employees. And part of that was that the contractors then would set up a very formal quality control program of a heavily documented program. The program was there before, but the documentation was such that uh, uh, it didn't meet, the, didn't meet the standards necessary to uh, satisfy this joint uh, AC military agreement. So the, the, we set up a uh, uh, quality program, and uh, uh, we had a quality control department and uh, the various activities that I uh, was involved in at that time. I had the quality control group. 
uh, uh, inspection department, a standards department, uh, the laboratories, uh, things, things of that nature. That uh, and uh, that went on for uh, some months. Let's take a little break, just a second. Uh, my next assignment was uh, manufacturing manager, which uh, left me with the response or gave me the responsibility for all of the manufacturing operations on the plant side. So uh, uh, I had groups in all of the all of the major buildings: uh, 44, 81, 91, 76, 77. 71, all of those. Uh, and uh, uh, that assignment I got uh, about, as I remember, about three weeks before the 1969 fire. And so that was my first real, uh, uh, the fire came along at, a, at an early time in that career. <laughs> First trial of fire. <laughs> fire. Absolutely, first trial of fire, right. Do um, you want to talk about the fire now, or do you want to keep going through your career? Uh, uh, we can come back to the fire if okay. you wish. Uh, uh, well, let's, let's take it. It sort, of, it sort of flows. We'll go with the fire right now. Uh, it was Mother's Day, uh, the afternoon about, I don't know, three o'clock, sometime in the afternoon because I had chicken on a grill. When I when I got a call that said that there is a uh, uh, there's a fire in uh, building 76, I, I believe, uh, and so I uh, jumped in the car and told Bev uh, I'll be back in time, but if don't let the chicken get gold, go ahead and and uh, have dinner. And the next thing I saw her was a bus. We, we disagree on this. She thinks it was two weeks. I think it was 12 days. It was before I got back home. Because <laughs> uh, we had set up, uh, got out there and, and uh, saw that uh, uh, we had a significant uh, problem to deal with. And uh, it was going to, uh, uh, I think I was probably the first or second or one of the first three outside people to reach the plant site. And outside being uh, off, off, off plant, okay. uh, off duty, yeah, right. I'm sorry, uh, off duty. And uh, uh, we then call in and we spent then the next, uh, the, the fire was under control uh, as far as the fire was concerned fairly rapidly. But then we had uh, a building that uh, uh, we be, uh, basically had to seal up, and uh, because there were no lights in it, and and start the assessment process, and it was necessary to start uh, finding people, putting teams together, uh, developing plans, and and uh, uh, it was quite important that we get this activity underway because we were the sole producer of plutonium parts in the country, so not only Rocky Flats being down as a producer of plutonium parts, it didn't affect the, the uh, weapons readiness or the weapons uh, program. It affected Los Alamos and Livermore because they were uh, almost dependent upon us to produce parts for their test program. So, and, and in essence, that was the most I would say the most serious problem was uh, to uh, develop a way to keep those two laboratories going. Uh, the, uh, it, in, in my mind, it was much more important in producing uh, a few more weapons in the next six to nine months. It was, was to keep the development activities uh, because, you know, there was a thousands of people involved in, in, in those laboratories and in the, the test sites and things like that on, on us being able to support them. And to develop that support was, was quite important. And the first thing we put all our emphasis on was to uh, 
develop a plan and a, a means of uh, getting back into that business, which we did, I think, after about four months. So as manufacturing manager, well, your responsibility was to keep the manufacturing flowing? Yes. 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 And it turned out after the fire was uh, 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 Lloyd Joshua, our general manager, uh, assigned various tasks to each, uh, each one of the, ver the, uh, the managers reported to him. And mine was, to, mine was the clean up and restoration of operations. And uh, Jim Wilging, Dr. Wilging's task was to uh, oversee the uh, investigation and support the investigation team that came in. And so we had several teams that uh, were assigned uh, activities to, to run the plant or to, uh, to, to develop our capability again uh, from what it was prior to the fire. So did the fire um, shake your confidence in your ability to produce these no. weapons safely? No, not at all. In fact, uh, it, it sort of reassured because, uh, there, because what happened, the systems did work. There, were, there was a little contamination that was on the top of one of the buildings. And essentially that was all and so it had a, a fire that was listed publicly in the uh, estimated a $50 million fire, which in 1969 was a lot of money. Uh, and yet the safety systems to contain the, uh, the contamination and to contain the materials in that building worked. And so, you know, uh, uh, that essentially reinforced the fact that uh, the systems that we that were designed and we had in place could handle a major event and still protect the community and and our workers and the uh, the view that we had uh, we'll probably talk about this a little bit more but uh, the view that we had towards you know uh, protecting the environment was if you protect your people and if the people that work there can work there safely and work in a safe environment, then everything external to that is going to be a safe environment. And, and that's the philosophy, and essentially we, we worked on, and that's, that, that worked nicely, and, and those, those systems did work. Um, so what was it like when you, when, you, when you got there, the fire had been put out already, or was it? Uh, they were still in there. Uh, when I got there, but several hours later, they essentially uh, had the fire out there. It's it's an interesting thing. The as I remember, and the report of the the government's official investigating committee said it was remarkable how much how little there was to burn and how little burned. Uh, what really burned in there were the plexiglass windows on the glove boxes. Uh, that was the primary source of the fuel that burned in there. Now there were lots of glove boxes and lots of plexiglass, but uh, there was not a lot of flammables in there. Uh, but when the, when the uh, glove box got on fire and the ventilation system was designed to keep materials flowing into the glove boxes, so if I'm a worker uh, and, and I'm working in a glove box, the air around me is going into the box instead of coming out. So that's the way that I'm protected from the material in there. That it doesn't leak out, it, all the air pushes it out. And it's, the air flows through the glove boxes then into through a whole bunch of filters and primary filters, secondary filters. And, and uh, those fans kept working and <laughs> so it kept bringing the heat and the flames right down the glove box lines. And so the gloves on the glove boxes and the, and the uh, plexiglass is, uh, is uh, really what was in, really what burned. Uh, and um, was this the, was it 69 fire or was it the 57 fire where they discovered that you can use water on plutonium fires? That would, it would have been the 69 fire. 
Uh, prior to that time, our thought was not to use, not to use uh, uh, water. Uh, and the thought being that uh, if, if you get enough, if you get a pool of water and you put enough powdered plutonium, if you will, in it, uh, you can get a situation where you could get, uh, you could reach a critical mass. Now, that's not an explosion by any stretch of the imagination. What you have is probably somebody within a few feet of it would get a serious radiation exposure, and you obviously want to avoid that. And that, of course, was the, probably our biggest concern in the chemical processing was to make sure that all of our vessels and our pipes and our containers were uh, inherently safe. So you designed them so that the shape of them precluded uh, a nuclear reaction or a critical mass uh, by accident or in, uh, by accident or so you, you could design a tube like this that was uh, such that uh, no, uh, no matter how much stuff you got in there, it was going to be critically safe. And so all our, our, our process equipment was designed that way. But you never knew what happened if you sprayed water, there may be a puddle over there someplace. And that was, that was the, the initial primary concern was uh, after the fire uh, and the thing that uh, we were most concerned about had water taken some uh, finely divided plutonium and collected in, in low spots. And we had some stairwells under glove boxes where you could get from one side to the other. And the initial concern was are those safe, uh, you know, to, to work around? Uh, and uh, can uh, you know? So the initial work we did with the nuclear safety people—that's the first thing we did—was get our nuclear safety people in there, and they ascertained that those uh, we could drain those and in, in, uh, uh, without any problems. So, um, <clears throat> what was the building like when you went in after the fire? Uh, I didn't go in the building for probably four weeks, maybe five weeks. Uh, to go in the building, you needed to uh, dress up in a in in, in a complete you know complete clothes with a with a full face mask and an air pack, and uh, uh, I didn't feel it was important to go in as a tourist to see what was going on. We had uh, it, it was. Difficult to get people in and out. Uh, only difficult in that, in that there was the preparation to get them in. It took a long time to suit somebody else, and when we when you came out, you had to be cleaned up. And and the health physics people, and we it it would strain resources to have uh, people who really didn't need to be in there, be in there. So I didn't go in for about five weeks. Uh, when I did go in, it was just there was just a lot of it. Uh, there were no lights, natural, none of the original lighting was still on, so we had lights strung on cords and things around, and it was very eerie looking, and because it was dark, you know, the, normally the thing looked like a supermarket in it, very brightly lit and very shiny and polished, and, and now we had uh, the results of a lot of soot and stuff uh, all over everything, and everything was dark, and, and it was uh, tough to see, and uh, uh, so it, uh, it was sort of overwhelming, I guess you'd say, to know, to look at that and say, gee, I remember standing here not too long ago and, and uh, uh, what this looks like now. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> so that was your trial by fire. Trial by fire. Well, then the... Uh, uh, the, uh, my next job was, uh, and I don't remember exactly when this took place either, uh, probably a year or two later, uh, I became the, uh, a year or so later, I became the 
uh, assistant general manager. And uh, at that time, the, we, the general manager split up the functions between himself and, and, uh, and myself. And uh, I took all of the operations, and he took all of the uh, 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 other activities. Uh, that's when, once we got back going again. Uh, and so uh, there I just had a little, a little wider scope, a few more activities were put into the package. And uh, I had that job until uh, 19, I guess it was, uh, Uh, late 73, early 74, I became general manager and, and, and was the last, Dow's last general manager there. And that's sort of my work first day. Uh, I, left, I left there and uh, uh, Dow sent me down to the Texas Gulf Coast where I had the uh, uh, assignment of trying to build a new plant on the Gulf Coast uh, to make specialty chemicals and spent two years down there buying land and building railroads and and things like that and along came an economic downturn in 1977 and they decided to delay that project so then I moved on to uh, uh, where was he? went to Ohio where I uh, Managed a, a, a op, was a manager of a plant for Dow in in Ohio, and uh, uh, essentially finished my career with Dow uh, in as a Eastern Division uh, uh, manager at Dow over in Cleveland, where we had uh, and that was that was a fun job because uh, interesting job because at that time. Dow had a lot of small, specialized plants around the country. And uh, our, my office was in Cleveland, but I had plants in Connecticut, Walnut Creek, California, uh, Florida, uh, Upper Michigan, uh, all over. I had, uh, there were 11 plants scattered around the U.S. So that job, I, until I retired, I think, in 19... 87, something like that, 1987. Uh, I just got tired of traveling. I looked at the calendar one day and I was off someplace and, and uh, I just landed at the airport in a terrible, terrible storm. And uh, everything, was, everything went wrong, the car didn't run, I got stuck on it and, and almost in a tornado and I finally got to a hotel and I uh, I, I called my wife, Bev, and I said, you know, there's got to be a weather away. And she says, why? Wh why do you do this? And I says, good idea. Because <laughs> I, I went back and looked, and I'd been, on the, I'd been out of town 97 nights the last year. Yeah. And Trump, so it, was just, it was just a wonderful time to go. And uh, so I retired from down 97. Went on to have another fun job. Another fun experience, you will. I uh, was a trustee and chairman of board of a 224-bed uh, uh, hospital, and uh, did that for about seven years. And that was fun times working in the uh, working in the, in the medical field. Although I, like most of the others, I had zero knowledge of it before I got started. Uh, turns out those kind of things, most times I find, are helpful. At least you know the uh, the uh, less preconceived ideas you have of what what needs to be done. And then I my last job was I had a little consulting business where I consulted in quality management for small small businesses. And then we moved uh, and we decided it was time to find a place to retire permanently and uh, and. Uh, too cold in Colorado. We we did our Colorado bit, and so uh, I had been down here obviously in the military, and uh, so we decided to do New Mexico. 
Um, so you got out of the nuclear business then with Dow after... Uh, yes. Yeah, I spent the rest of my career in uh, uh, the regular chemical business. And um, was, with Dow, why did you leave Rocky Flats to get into the chemical business? Was it... Oh, uh, Dow... Uh, uh, <clears throat> Uh, Dow's contract ran out in 1975, and Dow made a conscious decision not to try to renew that contract. Okay, that's, so that was when, when Dow left. Well. Yeah, that's when that's when I left. Yeah. Okay. And um, <clears throat> were you part of the decision not to renew the contract? Oh uh, yes. And why? Uh, it, the decision was was uh, fairly straightforward as far as Dow was concerned. We were invited in there, and we stayed as long as uh, uh, I think you could uh, say wanted. They uh, uh, the contracts were for I think the first one was for two or three years, and then from then on they were five-year contracts or something like that. And um, uh, our our problem in in later years had to do. Uh, and, and the primary reason that Dow chose not to renew the contract was uh, had solely to do with labor relations and a contract negotiation that took place some sometime in the early 70s. And, uh, uh, that was a uh, the again the. Uh, Agreement that we had in, in our in our contract with the government said that we will pay prevailing wages for people who you can hire in the local market, and you you we will use national uh, guidelines for hiring and paying people in the national market, such as uh, engineers and and uh, doctors and professional people of that, that nature. So uh, what we had to do was to demonstrate that any proposed salary increases or wage increases for hourly people were consistent with that uh, philosophy. And, and you can understand why that was. Uh, the government and, and Dow wouldn't have wanted to come in there and, and uh, uh, use the government operations to proselyte through wages people away from uh, other other industry in Denver area. We want to be competitive, but uh, not to, uh, what wouldn't have been fair to other businesses to, for instance, to pay a machinist two dollars an hour more to work at Rocky Flats. Than it would be to work in Denver. Uh, there were there were some provisions in the contract for where you worked. You got uh, you got uh, extra pay, and that was that was typical. But the base rates were essentially there. So what we did when in this contract, like all union contract, came up, uh, we did our wage surveys and uh, we got a. Uh, uh, an approval from the AEC for how far we could go, uh, and they we said this is what we think is fair, and they said you can negotiate up to that level, and you can't go any further. Well, uh, behind the scenes, there at the Washington level and the national unions were working a were working. We didn't know it. Uh, in the beginning, because we were having a very difficult negotiation, couldn't figure out what was. Uh, the, this was after the strike. Okay. No, this was before the strike. Okay. Uh, uh, we couldn't we couldn't find out what was happening. Oh, boy. And uh, I actually was on a negotiating committee at that time, uh, a member of it, and uh, I sat across the table from the international president of the United Mine Workers. I think it was. And he said, I don't understand why you people are so tight with the government's money. It's their money, not yours. And we're saying, no, wait a minute now, that's just, uh, something doesn't, something's not working here. 
Uh, Dow had a vested interest also in, in the settlement because the same union represented our the largest union at Dow's private practice, or private operations. So that we knew that any settlement that we would make in Denver would be a pattern for a settlement in other Dow locations. So we couldn't go off the deep end. Uh, from Dow's viewpoint, much less the government's viewpoint. So uh, I guess to make a long story short, we it became completely clear that the uh, labor relations people for the AC in Washington had basically come up with some sort of a backdoor agreement that uh, we would give them more than we said was fair. And Dow absolutely refused to do that. Uh, the then uh, senior managers at the AC said, "You know what you're doing. You know, uh, you're really telling us no." And we said, mm -hmm, "We understand what we're telling you." Uh, and so they then decided that, on that basis, that they would find, they would open it up to a new uh, to. Uh, uh, for competitive bidding to get another contractor. But it was, was solely over labor relations and so, solely over this one negotiation. And uh, Dow said, gee, you know, we've been here 25 years. Uh, if we're going to play games like this, uh, uh, we're not going to do this anymore. And I remember uh, sitting in the general sitting with the general manager in his office when the AEC manager from Albuquerque came in and said, we assume you're going to make a proposal on a contract. And we said, uh-uh, we have no intention of doing that. And he said, we thought all the time you would. And he said, no, uh, we don't have any intention of doing that. Uh, you know, we've, it's an opportunity for somebody else to come in. It's an opportunity to clean the slate. It's an opportunity to, for Dow to get on with his private business. Uh, as a matter of interest, uh, Dow really never made, if you, if you talk in terms of profit, bottom line profit, then Dow never made any money off that plant. The fee that we got for operating it uh, essentially paid the, paid the home office expenses of supporting the plant. And so there was no economic reason for us to continue. Uh, uh, the, uh, the fees that uh, were in effect at the time that uh, Dow ran the plant was, were such that uh, if you looked at the bottom line of the annual reports, you couldn't tell that Rocky Flats was there or not there. And uh, I'm, I was quite familiar with this because one of my side jobs there over the years was uh, as I essentially handled the contract for Dow. Uh, did the, did the contract approval changes, uh, was uh, part of the go down negotiating team for every five years negotiating a new contract, every year negotiating a fee. And so we looked at it one time and said, gee, we're, we're just barely covering uh, our expenses for home office support. So um, you said it was a backroom deal in Washington where the AEC and the union agreed to raise that, that Yes. And, and how did that come about, or do you have a speculation about that? Uh, uh, it, it would be pure speculation. The, the, uh, the AEC uh, manager, Washington manager for labor uh, relations, had a long history of uh, uh, association was labor with the labor movement. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, some relative of his, and I, I, uh, I, my memory says it was his mother, but I'm not sure, was Ma Perkins, who was uh, Secretary of Labor under FDR. And he had lots of, lots of labor. And I, uh, uh, 
and I guess it doesn't serve a lot of purpose to rehash old wounds, but there was, uh, they appointed a, uh, supposedly an impartial arbitrator to come in and arbitrate the issues, but we found that the arbitrator uh, was meeting secretly with the union at the national and local levels, which was totally out of line. Uh, and so the whole thing was just a, uh, a mess. And, and uh, the uh, executive vice president of Dow called the president, or called the AEC general manager and said, I want you to know that if there's a strike at Rocky Flats, you bear the sole responsibility of this, not us, and I will not be silent about it. And so it, there, there was just, it, it just was a mess. Uh, not a mess, but a, 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 a sad situation that uh, developed there. Um, so so did it, it ended up that the strike evolved from those negotiations then? I believe so, yes. Um, and and what, what was the ultimate outcome? Where did, where did the wages finally, because you, you didn't renew that, it was years later that, the, that Dow finally pulled out, right? Uh, yeah, so through, well, it was the end of the contract yeah, period. So. Uh, uh, as I remember, well, uh, it's sort of a truism that strikes are never settled by what you go on strike for. Mm -hmm. And uh, several of the people, the strikers were fired uh, because of strike line activity, activity on, uh, on, on strike line, uh, picket line, I'm sorry. And uh, the strike was essentially basically settled for what the last Dow offer was, plus reinstating the strikers. So that was the issue that was made it possible to, to settle a strike, was that we would bring back the, the people that had been discharged for disorderly conduct on the picket lines. Huh. So that must have been a, a difficult time to go to work. Oh, yeah. But it, yeah, I got caught in the in the initial day of the strike, I was, uh, the strike was supposed to take place at seven o'clock in the morning, so I thought I'd go to work early, but the strikers went to work earlier. Mm -hmm. And so I got, uh, but I knew almost all of them, and they were friends, so they, uh, you know, they would come by and give me a hard time, and I'd give them a hard time, but it, it wasn't a matter of, of uh, Physical violence, you know. They, they, we had they, we on an individual basis we had great respect for each other. As a, so, you were Hyatt manager then. It would yes. Be a, a particular target of their ire at that time. Uh, well, they were having fun with me. Yeah, they <laughs> were showing me how they could turn my car over and things like that. Did they turn your car? Oh, they tried to, but it was I had a pretty heavy Jeep, but they did turn one over and and uh, uh, messed with several others. But you know they. Uh, uh, and uh, it, uh, but well, you know, the nice part about it is a bunch of a bunch of the strikers came up and said, "Hey, you know, we're not going to mess with this guy." Uh, uh, and uh, so it, uh, you know, as I say, on an individual basis, uh, uh, strikes are strange things because uh, it's true there are no winners. And it's also true that every strike I'd been involved with was never settled on the issue that people went out on, and it, it's, it's sort of tragic, but it's, uh, uh, I guess, sort of the games people play. Yeah. Were you in the car when they tried to tip it over? No, I was out talking to them. Okay. They were just having fun. Okay. Well, it's, um, we're at right about an hour, so I'm going to stop yeah. this and take a break.
Oral History Project. I'm Hannah Nordhaus. I'm interviewing Herb Bowman at his house in Rio Rancho, New Mexico. Um, and it's the 2nd of September, 2004. So we were just talking about the strike and the union. Um, yes. And I, just, I was hoping that before we move on to other subjects, you could tell me a little bit about the role of the union at Rocky Flat and sort of the impact you thought it, it had there. Uh, the DAS position on unions was uh, fairly straightforward. If the uh, employees wanted a union, that's their decision. Uh, from a uh, human relations standpoint, uh, we believe that uh, uh, if you treat people fairly, honestly, uh, that there's, you, there's no need for a union. But if, if uh, uh, employees want to organize. Certainly, we're not uh, not a, you know not opposed to unions because we have them in our in in our in our uh, major operations and had had them for years and and uh, did not uh, uh, resist or uh, uh, the original organizational movement at at, at Dow. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, the unions were uh, uh, the the thing that I guess that uh, uh, you, you need, uh, people need to understand about about a union is a union, at least on the national level, uh, which brings down to the local level, is a business. Uh, they have employees. They have pension plans. Uh, they need sources of income to fund these sort of things, so uh, they uh, are in, in essence a form of a business, a form of a service, if you will, uh, re representing employees. But uh, So that uh, in order to uh, get people to join you and to become involved, you have to perceive that a service is being performed. And uh, so, in order to do that, you have to, uh, in some way, convince people that without them, things would be uh, uh, difficult or unfair, or uh, and that uh, if you pay me, I'll represent you. Uh, and so, uh, a number of the day-by-day uh, -day activities of uh, uh, of a union environment are that, where uh, uh, in some cases there's no question that a, uh, a supervisor someplace overstood or overstepped, overstepped bounds. In other cases, there's, it's completely clear that uh, uh, there's, really no, there's really no issue here. But in, in that particular case, the uh, union has to represent them and has to take the case forward. So, uh, as I said again on a personal basis, uh, uh, I enjoyed well, knowing and working with uh, the union leadership. Uh, I considered them to be uh, decent people. Uh, but we all obviously in many occasions saw things from two different sides. Uh, and I don't know what, what else to say about, to, about the relationship. Did, did, do you think that the union had a salutary effect on, on safety or um, any, any worker issues? That uh, I don't believe that they were the driving force on safety. Uh, there was a joint safety committee uh, that uh, dealt with, with with safety issues, but all the pressure I felt f on safety and uh, the need to perform safely came from management. Uh, early on in uh, my career, in fact, the first year I was there, uh, I talked to several of the Midland people the Midland, Michigan people, the home office people that came out to be part of Rocky Flats operation. And I was quite interested. I said, you know, what does it take to succeed in Dow? 
And to a man, they said, the number one issue is to work safely. If you're going to have a career with Dow, you better not have an accident. Uh, and that left a lasting impression on me. And our first general manager, uh, uh, Heine Langell, there was no question in my mind or anybody else's mind that safety was his number one priority. You had an accident and he was on you like a wet blanket. Uh, and uh, there was an executive safety council. And every senior manager was on that council. And if in his department there was some sort of a safety issue, he had a chance to explain that to the general manager who was chairman of the safety council, uh, to him and all his peers. And so you worked pretty hard at making sure that you could everything you could do uh, in, in the field of safety was to ensure the safe, the safe operations uh, and the safety of your people. Um, well, I'm, I'm not going to go to the building questions yet because mm -hmm. let's talk about safety now um, sure. since we're here. So um, especially in the later years, uh, the public had a real perception and continues to have a perception that Rocky Flats wasn't a safe place. Um, obviously, you didn't feel this was so. I, I'm wondering how um, how that evolved, and and maybe also how, in hindsight, whether things were different than when you got started. Uh, no, I I believe that. Well, I can't speak after 1975. Right. I don't know what happened after 1975, but uh, uh, there was an anti-nuclear movement that took place. Uh, the, the, that was uh, a, a nationwide issue, and we're still paying for it today because the safest, soundest, best source of energy that's available to us is nuclear energy, nuclear power plants. Are, uh, and, and unfortunately, uh, the anti-nuclear movement has been able to paint them with a broad brush uh, as, as a safety issue. Uh, and uh, essentially stopped. Every, everybody else in the world is still building plants. They're still building them in Europe, still building them in Japan, still building them in the, they're building in the Far East. Not in the U.S. And yet we are the most energy demanding nation around. And it's a, it's a, it's a tragedy. But uh, that's a different issue for a different time. Uh, but the anti-nuclear movement uh, in any war, any weapons, nuclear weapons movement, uh, we're able to, uh, through demonstrations and, and uh, uh, press releases and charges and that sort of thing, uh, create an, uh, an atmosphere of, I guess you'd say, distrust. Uh, we've, we found, and it's been our practice, and, and still was our practice. It turns out we're the only people that ever had to tell the truth. Anybody else can make any charge against you and uh, against the flats and, and uh, uh, we, you know, you have to defend it. Uh, but, you know, you can't make a, you can't make a, uh, uh, an untruthful charge against someone else and say, well, uh, you know, you should have known better. You shouldn't have told, you, you know, you know better than that. Uh, and so when it, when it came time to debating these issues, we're the only people that ever actually ever had to tell it to. Somebody could say, well, you did this. And we say, absolutely not. And, and you know, we can give you all the data you want. Well, you're hiding data. Uh, and so the, the issue goes on and on. You know, what are you hiding? What's, what's behind it? Part of that obviously came from the first probably 20 years, let's see, 55, 65, uh, so the first 18 years or so, uh, with the secrecy surrounding the plant. Uh, that uh, it was out there, but uh, what, what in detail took place was not. Uh, 
uh, discussed in public. And in fact, uh, Bev and my kids will be delighted to see what we're talking about today because they never heard this before. Uh, well, I, I lived two lives. You know, you lived the life at Rocky Flats and then you lived the life in the community. And uh, uh, that's, uh, and it was the way it started. In, in, 19, in 1951, uh, everything was secret. We were in the midst of just starting a Cold War and uh, the plant itself was compartmentalized, if you would. Mm -hmm. The people in one building supposedly didn't know what was happening in another building. And the production control job was a classical example of that because the final assembly plant was the only thing that saw the parts made in the rest of the plant. Uh, that's where they put the production control to schedule the rest of the plant. If they'd have put it in one of the other units, they would have known what was happening. So it's, it, it was that sort of thing. And uh, my wife Bev worked out there, but she couldn't leave the front office. She couldn't get anywhere, even though she was, had a security clearance uh, because I worked in the plant she had to stay in the personnel department and, and uh, uh, wasn't allowed anywhere out in the plant uh, at all from this compartmentalization hmm. bit. So, uh, and it, uh, so that, that was the way the plant started and the culture that was created. And so that carried through uh, this, this secrecy, not knowing, uh, uh, and, and it wasn't until probably in the night, night probably till uh, the aftermath of the 1969 fire that that started to break down. Mm -hmm. And um, I get the sense that there's perception that the secrecy led to a lack of oversight. I don't understand that. Uh, by whom? Um, I don't know, but th that by operating in secret secrecy. The critics of the plant would say that by you, that there was because the plant was able to operate in secrecy that they didn't there's no, no one to answer to about being safe. Oh, okay. Uh, that we had the same scrutiny as any industrial plant, mm -hmm. as far as outside agencies. The Department of Labor came in and oversaw. They were clear. They were cleared people. They had. They had security clearances, but uh, they came in and overlooked our safety programs. Uh, the AEC themselves had an audit teams that audited the bejesus out of us. Uh, the toughest audits we had, it turned out, was from our home office. When one of our home office auditors would get through with us, uh, you know that you had had, had an audit uh, because they were actually more critical than, than some of our outside agencies. But we, there was, as far as outside surveillance, there was all sorts of it. Uh, people looking after, after us. And we issued basically from, uh, essentially from the first years a, an annual environmental report reporting any and everything that took place as far as uh, uh, what happened uh, beyond the perimeter of the plant site. Now the secrecy was, was uh, uh, mainly how things were made, what was made, uh, how it was handled, that sort of thing, rather than uh, uh, other, other kind, other than uh, the effects in the environment and, and what was happening out there. Uh, if you look at if you look at secret, what you know, why, why such secrecy? It's uh, nothing we were doing out there could could not have been and hasn't been discovered by uh, because we're dealing with physical principles, you know, principles of nature, if you will, and so anybody can. Uh, if they want to study hard enough and work hard enough and have the resources, build an atomic weapon. Mm -hmm. What secrecy does is make them pay for it. We don't give them the 
result of our research for nothing. And that's what, what protecting the secrets was about. So somebody didn't get the designs and the tooling and uh, the processes that were used to, to do these things that the United States had paid billions of dollars for. And that's what, that's what the secrecy was protecting. Um, I guess it seems like one issue, um, say the issue that still is controversial is, is waste disposal, um, waste handling and disposal. And um, the 903 pad and, and various um, contamination issues out at the site now. Um, from the perspective of Dow and in the early days, was that just something that wasn't on the radar screen or? Oh no, it was, uh, it, it was on there. Uh, the 903 pad, uh, there's an, uh, a long, long history of that. And, and when, when the switch came from, that I talked about earlier, going from the nuclear package being separate from the rest of the uh, atomic weapon to being an integral part of it, uh, required some uh, new kinds of tooling and machining capabilities. And part of that, when you, when you machine a metal, you need a coolant of some sort uh, and uh, uh, a lubricant so that your cutting tool uh, slides over the cuts, cuts on the surface instead of chatters, if, is the simplest way to put it. And the cooling tool is so that uh, the tool doesn't get hot and the piece you're cutting doesn't get hot. Mm -hmm. And so you flood it with this cooling. Uh, so this, this lathe coolant uh, was a combination of uh, an oil and carbon tetrachloride. Uh, that was filtered and uh, in the beginning we had a process that we had run a, a little pilot plan on called a centrifuge. Mm -hmm. And what we would do is we would put this coolant in there and spin it if you would and uh, uh, it would separate out the plutonium particles from the oil and then it, uh, when we tried to scale that up uh, to a full size process, it didn't scale. And so now we had plutonium, we had some plutonium coolants and we put it in drums and we started on a chemical process for doing this and we built uh, and, and the, interesting, the interesting thing about all of this, this is all on the frontier of technology. Nobody's ever done this before, so there was no place to go to find out and copy. We had to develop all of this ourselves. And so you would come up with an idea, you'd run a small scale in the laboratory, then we'd build a pilot plan. And we'd build a pilot plan, we'd run it a while, and oh my, it didn't work. It didn't. It wasn't doing what we thought, so we uh, would modify that. This took place over several years while we were building a, a trying to develop a plant that would handle these, these coolants. In the meantime, we were storing the sludge to be processed. Uh, we found out that uh, carbon tetrachloride uh, under certain conditions is a little corrosive. And so uh, there was some rust in some of the drums and some of this coolant leaked out. And we found it in, uh, essentially immediately the, because the health physics people monitored this area, but it was there. So we would continue to monitor and we would repackage in the stuff in new drums. We put uh, an inhibitor in them so that they wouldn't rust. Uh, all the while, we're just about ready to build this plant that's going to work. Uh, and so we would clean up uh, a spot and uh, uh, where a drum had leaked and, and we'd dig the dirt up and put it and ship it off someplace. And this went on for several years. So to say we weren't uh, aware of what was going on is, is just not factual. Uh, had uh, had uh, and then then we did come up with the way to process it, 
and we started moving the drums out of there. So when we got through, we had a pad the size of my living room here or something like that that uh, had some contamination in it. And the uh, uh, initial reaction to that was to cover it until we could, uh, to keep it from, from migrating until such time as we could find uh, uh, or get what looked to be uh, a solution to a way to handle that dirt. Mm -hmm. And uh, we covered it with gravel and eventually uh, covered it with asphalt. And uh, uh, during that time, there were a couple, if, if you live in a Boulder area and you know, the wind blows, and the Rocky Flats, it blew exceptionally well. Uh, uh, we, uh, we were in <laughs> right there where it blew very well out there. Uh, there were a couple windstorms that blew some of that contamination out to the perimeter. And our fence monitors caught that, and we knew that. Uh, and uh, we knew that there was some airborne contamination uh, uh, still below the limits, but still above zero. And this is plutonium contamination? Yes. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> and uh, uh, so there, there's no question, and we knew there was off-site contamination. We had measured it. Uh, uh, there was essentially no standard for plutonium in soil, so all you can do is report that there's so many something or others per something or other. Right. Uh, but the, the airborne uh, stuff that we saw in our, our fence monitors, uh, at, at one particular windstorm, uh, let us, uh, well, we knew that it was out there. So, um with RICRA and, and all the, the different regulations nowadays and, and with the, the attention that's paid to waste, would it have been done differently now or, or was there no option to do it differently? Uh, I, I'd, uh, that's, uh, uh, I, I, that's one of those questions like, uh, would you amputate the guy, what you know about surgery today, would you still amputate the guy's leg in the Civil War? Uh, you know, you're asking me to apply today's uh, what's happened after after 50 years or 25 years or 30 years to what happened 30 years ago. I don't know. I, uh, to the best of my knowledge, we operated within all of the known limits and requirements that were established by. Uh, uh, all of the health and safety organizations. Uh, it seems to me, I mean, that's, I guess, hindsight's twenty twenty, right? Yeah, you're right. Saying that, that one of the um, issues with the perception of, of lack of safety at Rocky Flats is, is this hindsight issue, that um, the people are looking at the practices 50 years ago with today's options. Hi, hindsight, and I, I, do, I, you know, I don't know how to, I'm not exactly sure how to, put that in perspective because uh, uh, the thing that, the, one of the things that was m most exciting about Rocky Flats is that we were working on the very edge of technology the entire time I was there. We were doing things that, and developing things that had never been done anywhere mm -hmm. and constantly doing that we, in, in all aspects of the operation uh, so that it's, now that now that you look at it, you say, "Gee, that, gee, that's pretty simple stuff." You know. But uh, back then, it wasn't even known. It didn't, uh. um, <clears throat> just to wrap up the safety thing, um, do you feel that the people who, um, well, were you ever exposed to contaminants to, to radioactivity? Or I was. Did, I, I was. A couple of times, I had some uh, some skin contamination, which was washed right off. Contamination, you call it? Pardon? Skin contamination, do they call it? <laughs> I don't, we just, uh, that's a term I haven't heard before, Anna. Uh, okay. <laughs> that's, that's a different one. Uh, 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 I got my hands in a, in a glove box and, and got some stuff on there and, and, and got, you know, it washed off and quite a bit. Oh, heavens no. And no, um, they, that uh, uh, there was a, a lot more dangerous places to work than Rocky Flats as far as I was concerned. 
because uh, it's only dangerous if if you don't take the if you don't take the right precautions. And the as I say early on, the training I got at Los Alamos and and uh, the uh, early training and, and uh, views that I got from the Dow people that came on their, their views towards safety. Uh, basically said, you know, if you, can, if you can't do it safely, so you build systems so that it is safe, so that it isn't uncomfortable. Didn't bother me at all to walk around there and look at that stuff. Um, did you feel that the people who, um, who were exposed or whose safety, whose health has suffered, have been taken care of? Uh, I understand this is, uh, uh, I understand there is a, a program, in fact, I think uh, uh, Pete Domenici and uh, uh, our Senator Bingman were behind it that is, that is now providing additional resources and additional routes for people who worked in the uh, uh, weapons program to uh, uh, get compensation and get health programs and things that, that weren't there. I, I don't know, the, uh, the one area that I think that uh, uh, probably is the most difficult that we're finding out that we seem to have more cases than anything else is, is with beryllium. And uh, frankly, beryllium was a frustration uh, when I was in the manufacturing business. Uh, it, didn't, it wasn't radioactive. And uh, people had been so conditioned to respect radioactive materials that when you said you, we need to respect this material also, but it's not radioactive, it didn't get the same kind of care. And I know that our health people and uh, uh, a number of our supervisors said, I just, it's most frustrating, I just can't get them to pay attention. The people who are working with them? Yeah, you? they just, just don't view it as, as seriously as they, it's not being viewed as seriously as, and so we have more cases, I think, of beryllium exposure than anything else. Did, did you know, did, did Dow know at the time um, just what the long-term effects were of beryllium exposure? We, sure. And that's why we, that's why we had a, a health program for it. Mm -hmm. And we had a sampling program and, and had in place safety practices and stuff that were just more difficult to get people to take uh, in the same level of care as they did if, if the materials were radioactive. Was, That's my impression. Yeah, so it wasn't, beryllium was not in the hot area, right? It was in a beryllium area that was treated as a, I, you, you couldn't use the word hot, but, but no, but, but it's a special area. Yeah, it, yeah, it was, in, you had, it was a special area, special filter, special equipment, special ventilation on it, you wore respirators, but uh, every once in a while somebody didn't wear a respirator. Fuck out, didn't do something. And you'd get on them and, and uh, but, uh, uh, and I don't want to blame you, I'm not here trying to in any way, shape or form and blame the employees, it was just that they weren't hot, if you will, and so it was a more difficult area to uh, to get the same level of concern. Do you? I, I wonder, from like a workflow perspective, if, would you, if you did it again, could you? If would you put beryllium in the hot area or something so that people would treat it with more? Concern? Well, as I say, it was it, it was in a it was in building forty four, which was a uranium area. But it was a special part of the building, separate ventilation, separate access, separate clothes changes, uh, everything separate about it, separate safety practices. So it it was, uh, and uh, again, I I don't want 
to leave the impression that these people were sloppy by no stretch of the imagination. Uh, but it did turn out that that was an area that left more uh, people with health problems than anything else we ever dealt with. So they were a little sloppier than the I, no, I won't use the word sloppy, okay. uh, uh, because I don't believe that they were, in in this in my sense of the term, sloppy. Right. Okay. Um, well, now that we're talking about the buildings, let's. Um, <clears throat> I wonder if you could describe the different. Um, it's when we interview people, I'm always amazed. These buildings seem to have a life of their own. They have their own. You know, I was in building forty-four yeah. or whatever it is. Um, did these different buildings have different environments of work cultures that you perceived overseas? Uh, yes, uh, for two reasons. Uh, one was the materials I handled. Uh, if you went to 71 building, it was plutonium. And uh, uh, you were, of course, there were glove boxes and, and everything was in enclosures and uh, uh, we worked through gloves and and that sort of thing. If you went to building 44, it was uh, uranium. And uh, uh, it, it had its own, it had its own set of uh, practices and procedures and, and the primary concern in building 44 was radiation f as, as coming from the material, not as potentially airborne. So they, they had plenty of ways to control any particular airborne material, but that wasn't its primary. It was more like a heavy metal, like breathing. You know, you'd have the same problem if you had lead or something. Uh, so, uh, and then 81 building was a, uh, uh, an enriched uranium building, and it had its own particular uh, setups and practices and that sort of thing. Uh, early on, the... Uh, the cultures were established early on by the initial managers in those areas. Uh, they were totally, obviously, different people. Uh, Bud Venable, who was the uh, plutonium, uh, he was the manager of 71 building, came from Los Alamos. And uh, a lot of the culture of that building came from his philosophies and his uh, whereabouts. Uh, Lyle Zotner, who was the enriched uranium, uh, came, brought his knowledge and stuff from Oak Ridge. And so he had his own uh, kind of uh, philosophy and operational practices and things like that. Ed Walco, who was the assembly manager when I, my boss in Los Alamos and then came to Rocky Flats, uh, of course brought the Los Alamos culture with him. And so the, those buildings, uh, not only had the environmental differences, but the cultural differences of their leaders, and I, uh, uh, they were di they were strikingly different. Um, were they also different? Um, it seems like reflecting the time they were built, the the first that was eighty one building was the, the ninety one building is the first building 90. built. That was the uh, final assembly building, and that was the one that was completed, and I worked in about a year before the rest of them. The other buildings came on pretty close along. I would guess 44 because of its nature uh, didn't uh, came on second as far as production. The underground ones? No, it was a 44 was above ground up by administration building. Uh, the three main buildings that were underground or down in little canyons or arroyos with 71 billing, 91 billing, and 81 billing. They put those there to protect them from uh, an enemy atomic attack, thinking that you could knock out all three of them. And uh, that's why they, they build them that way. Uh, and that's why they're fairly difficult to knock down, because they're fairly substantial concrete structures. Uh, and so if you hit one, you didn't knock out the whole plant. But the uh, 44 buildings stood up on the flat, on the flats up there, along with the warehouse, fire department, headquarters, all of those things. Was the 90, well, what was it like to work in the 91 building, working underground? Uh, it was great, because 
the front end of the building was offices, and it faced it faced the south and uh, south and and uh, the offices faced south and, and west. And in the summertime, it was probably 100 degrees in the offices. Uh, in the back end, uh, as I said, the building was really split into two sections. There was a, a front part, the, uh, and again, it's typical of security. You went through a security post to actually get on the grounds, and that got you into the administrative part. And then there was another security post uh, that you had to have additional clearance to get into the back end. Now that was air conditioned because to, ha to process the materials and handle them and measure them and, and inspect them, you had to have a controlled atmosphere. So if you worked back there, you worked in the only air conditioned spot early on in the plant. The original headquarters building was not air conditioned. They didn't have any air conditioning there for human comfort in the, uh, in the initial construction of the plant. So all of the office all the offices were rather warm in the summertime. Uh, so it was nice to work in the back end. <laughs> um, what was your favorite building? Favorite building. I, I, would, I would say 91 building because that's my original building. It's a building I helped want to design with and the building I helped equip and the place I spent the first four or five, four years or so working. Did you see um, the building, obviously the buildings evolved with new processes in the years. Yes. Um, was it sort of a continual ongoing renovation on these buildings? Yes, because uh, uh, as the uh, design laboratories uh, came up with new weapons to do new things, uh, there were all there were weapons in the stockpile all the way from uh, almost the sizes of a trunk up to uh, 15 feet long. And uh, so there's a huge array of, of uh, weapons to do various kinds of things under each, each weapon system had a, a, a purpose in life. and. Uh, or a purpose. And uh, so as those came on, you had to develop new techniques to build the components for them. And uh, that required new equipment, new kinds of uh, uh, processes that hadn't uh, ever been done before. For instance, we were, we had, uh, were able to develop a process for welding aluminum where you could put two pieces of aluminum together and we could weld them to where you couldn't ever find a weld joint they, and without any additional processing. So it, it was uh, uh, something never been done before. And uh, uh, we did that with other kinds of materials and metals and uh, it uh, uh, very for that kind of business, very high tech. Uh, and the precision, you know, we were, had, them, had to machine rather large parts down to uh, within plus or minus a thousandth of an inch over a long distance, and that's, that's quite a, a task. We did some of the, I don't know if you paid any attention to the automobile advertising anymore, but they talk about all of the new cars have what's called hydroformed frames, where they formed the metal by a process called hydroforming. But well, we were we developed hydroforming out of Rocky Flats back in the back in the 1960s, first first place that had been used on a production scale. So, uh, and uh, now they're finally getting around to putting in automobiles for its unique capabilities. So, fun times. Seems like the nuclear weapons program and the space program. Okay. Yes, a yeah. <clears throat> a whole bunch of the technology from there, uh, the, in, in the non-nuclear parts, the, uh, the uh, cabling, the transistors, the, the things like that for micro, micro technology uh, 
that made little radios and, and little things possible all came out of that. Well, um, what, uh, you, we mentioned the 69 fire. Um, what are your memories of the 57 fire? I was a 91 building, which is just down the airstream from that. And my, my only memory of that was that we were notified that there had been a problem in 71 building and uh, that uh, we should go up to the parking lot and wait further instructions and a team of health physics people came down and and checked out uh, uh, the building the grounds the uh, around it and uh, gave us a go ahead to go back to work and that's all i knew about it until i until subsequently uh, later we had heard that there had been a a plutonium fire and it, it contaminated a room and then later on in later years I read the report of it but and did that help help uh, help how you dealt with the 69 fire it, it the results of some of the the results of the investigation of the was it 57 fire what was 57 fire uh, helped us in some of the design work that went into some of the new buildings yes results of that investigation. Okay. Um, so you were gone when the, um, long gone, when the FBI raid happened. Yes. And I assume you heard about it. Yes. And I wonder um, what you thought about it. Uh, I was, uh, I had no, had no idea what, what the issues were. Uh, the, the, I had heard that there had been a problem that had generated and waste handling between the AEC and the would been Department of Energy then I guess the Department of Energy and the EPA mm -hmm. uh, who had jurisdiction over what a jurisdictional issue and I had heard from some of my friends that Rockwell somehow got got in the middle of this I had a choice of following what the Department of Energy said or what the EPA said. And uh, that's, that's my sole knowledge of it, of the issues involved, that who had jurisdiction and what rules were to be followed. Were any of the um, Dallas practices brought up for scrutiny during that time? When I have no idea, because I don't know what, I have no idea what took place at, at the, uh, plant after I left in 1975. I was back there once when, for an open house when 371 building was completed. They invited a bunch of old gray beards back to, uh, for an open house and that's the last time I'd been back there. Is it, was it different? Had, did it seem that uh, the place had changed? The parts that I saw had uh, uh, hadn't changed much the administrative building and the and the auditorium out front and and of course I hadn't seen 371 I saw it under construction because we were responsible for the design of, of getting that building going but it wasn't built it was under construction when we left um, so um, were, the, were there large-scale protests when you were there or the yes there were some there? the larger scale protests as I understand it took place after we left there were protests. But there were protests there, but not the, the scale that took place after we left. And how did um, how did you feel about them? How did you handle them? Just went out and talked to them. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, they have no problem there. As long as uh, there's no civil disobedience, uh, fine. In fact, I'd love to talk to them. Unfortunately, I don't find many open minds in groups like that. They seem to be single issue single focused uh, one specific kind of thing and, and uh, uh, I, I never felt that uh, they were listening. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that their main purpose was and 
perhaps they had the same feeling about me. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was no problem with talking to them. In fact, we, we went out in the community uh, uh, and, uh, in the 70s after 69 fire to, try, uh, to talk to people and hold open houses and go around in, in the various communities and high schools and, and uh, talk to people, try to answer any and, any and all of their questions. Uh, but uh, eventually uh, we would run into single issue people who were there to argue with us about the, the wisdom of having atomic weapons and that's, you know, that's beyond my scope. Uh, that's <laughs> Speaking of that, um, yeah. <clears throat> what, um, how did you feel about working in a plant that produced nuclear weapons? Or produced I, f I felt that uh, at, the, at the time, I felt it was absolutely necessary. Uh, I, uh, to this day, I uh, am absolutely convinced that had not that been, uh, had not our Prima, if we didn't have a, uh, a supreme position in, in retaliatory capability, that we're there, we'd have been in a big war a long time before this. That that was effective in keeping a lid on on things. I I believe that, and and at the same time, uh, we used to talk about this. Jim Wilging and Bill Lee and I and several of the guys, we would look forward to the day when there was no more Rocky Flats. Because uh, at my training at Rocky Flats, I mean, sorry, my early training at Los Alamos, I got to see the results of what atomic weapons can do. Uh, I was out at Nevada test site for tests and, and firsthand saw what those little, what those things were capable of. And so, you know, uh, in your nightmares, you dread the day that any of that ever, ever would happen. And so, while we were absolutely convinced that what we were doing was necessary, God, we look forward to the day when there would be no more need for Rocky Flats. Because that meant that by that time, our social skills may have caught up with our technical skills. And you could only hope for that day. Well. We've reached a day where there's no more Rocky Flats. I don't know if there's no more need for Rocky Flats. Right. But um, how did you feel when you heard that um, there was going to be no more Rocky Flats? Uh, that's a political decision, as far as I was concerned. Uh, how we fight our wars, uh, in, in what way and what, what they're structured and how our system is set up, uh, uh, is, is, is set up in our government. And uh, uh, so when I heard there was no more Rocky Flats, I was, I was a little bit dismayed as a taxpayer that from 1989, was it, when they stopped? Uh, yeah. Till 1997 when they started that there were five or six thousand people out there and I couldn't figure what in the world those people were doing. They weren't making anything. And uh, so I had no idea, you know, what, what uh, it looked to me like a, a government uh, program to fight unemployment. But that's, a, that's an issue that somebody sees from a distance because I had no idea what the, what, what since it was no longer a production plant and it wasn't being torn down. Um, do you think that site, you know, now hindsight again, would you select that site now to be a nuclear weapons plant? That site not, no, because uh, they built to it. Uh, if, you, if you look at the original criteria that was used that the Dow and the government had for siting that plant, it said, you need to be uh, 15 miles from a major center, employment center. Uh, you need to have air, tra you need to have an airport close by, you need to have rail transportation. Uh, and that met all of the criteria. That is exactly uh, 
the ideal place to see cite that plant back in 1951. In fact, the first time I went to try to find it, I couldn't find the plant site. Because uh, Highway 93 was an almost impassable road. Uh, from Boulder to Golden, if it had rained or so uh, in the previous week or so, you couldn't make it. Did a dirt run? Oh, yeah. It wasn't paved, uh, it wasn't paved until Dow had been there four or five years. Oh. We, we traveled out there in the dirt road for years. So it, it's, you, and Arvada, when I, came, when I came back to Rocky Flats, I went through Arvada and there was a gas station at the corner of Wadsworth and Highway 72. There were no houses around there. It was a, it was a rural farming community. Denver was in the distance to the east. So uh, was that a, a place to site that plant? Sure. There was nothing wrong with that. The fact that it's, it's the old airport syndrome. You build an airport that's 25 miles away from everything, and then they build up around it, and suddenly the airport's a problem. Going going over their head, yeah. So uh, a lot of Arvada then was really built, was, did it build up around Rocky Flats? Did oh, sure. That's, that is the, the real reason for the initial growth in Rocky Flats. Uh -huh. The initial housing that was built in Arvada was essentially to support the Rocky Flats workers. Uh -huh. Our Arvada just wasn't there. There was, a, as I say, a gas station. That, Wadsworth in 72, and from there on, it was just all farms around there. Have you seen it lately? Oh, yeah, I've been up there. Um, Boulder was the same way once you left the University of Colorado. Yeah. On uh, there at uh, Baseline, and uh, you know, there was no uh, National Brewer standards or anything south of there. Right. Uh, baseline was the furthest road south in Boulder. When you left Baseline to go to Rocky Flats, that was it. Hmm. Um, so do you still think there's a need for Rocky Flats? Even if there's no, I mean, I have no way. To see if they cease production of those flats. I have no way of knowing, uh, uh, knowing whether there's a need to build replacement weapons because they've aged or new weapons because they're new design. I just don't have any, any, any need for that. Again, I hope someday uh, we've done an unbelievable job of, of uh, uh, reducing stockpile so far. Uh, the, you know, when you when you take five, ten thousand weapons out, that's a that's a tremendous amount of energy that you can't release, uh, unleash on somebody. And that's a, uh, uh, maybe, as I said, maybe someday we'll learn to live with each other. Yeah, I hope. Um, so I just had a couple of sort of random follow-up questions. Sure. Um, <clears throat> what, were there issues, um, or what sort of issues did the plan encounter when women came to work in the, um, in, in the production areas in large numbers? I don't know of any that uh, that uh, uh, we had. It's it's interesting because Bev over there will tell you when uh, the original plant manager, uh, very shortly after the plant started, within the first year, issued a ruling there would be no husband and wives employed at the plant. He did that because of security purposes. His, his, his idea of compartmentalization, he took very seriously. And so he said, uh, we just won't have that because they may talk. Uh, a good friend of mine in personnel uh, hired her just before we were married. So, you <laughs> so, didn't meet at the plant, but... No, we didn't meet at the plant. Uh, she was uh, uh, working in Denver and... and uh, uh, so she just got a, so she was hired and then we got married. <laughs> so then that was okay. Well, they didn't fire you for that, for, for, for that. But I don't, uh, we had a fairly strict, uh, again, from our early plant manager, you were allowed six months if you were pregnant and then you had to leave. 
Uh, he did, he and it was part of the employment practice that uh, after six months you had to leave. If you were pregnant, uh, we didn't put you. You weren't. You didn't. You had to. We moved you out of uh, uh, the plant where, where radiation was, and, and put you in other in other jobs. Uh, so I don't ever remember that being an issue with us. I remember hearing a story about um, the laundry. There are issues with uh, women's with the boxer shorts and uh, oh. women's uniforms versus the men's uniforms. I you never heard that. Like that. No, that's fun. I, I can tell you it once the tape's off <laughs> if I can remember it. But um, and, and how about uh, minorities, minority groups when they were hired in? Um, uh, we were a leader in minority. Uh, hiring in the Denver area. Uh, we had goals uh, uh, for minority hiring probably before anybody else in the Denver area. Uh, and uh, uh, worked, at, worked at hiring minorities. We searched nationwide for uh, professional minorities and, and uh, tried to hire local minorities. Uh, uh, again, I don't uh, remember that being a, any sort of a specific problem. Were there any issues in the rank and file? Uh, uh, I'm sure there, there, there probably were. Uh, there were nationwide. Yeah. You know, there was this great dissolution that after the, the Civil Rights Act that tomorrow morning things would be different. Uh, and the newspaper headline said, you know, it's a different America. Well, it wasn't a different America. It's the same as it was yesterday. And you had to work at that for a long time. You had to work at it hard. Uh, we worked hard at sensitivity team. We, we uh, had several sessions of uh, training all of our managers, including myself, at... Uh, uh, the issues involved in in being a minority and, and working in there. Uh, I guess unless you've really suffered discrimination, you have no concept of what it is. And so to say I'm entitled to discriminate, you know what you're talking about, because you haven't, you know, haven't been in my shoes. You don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, and so we work pretty hard at trying to do that. But, uh, a couple of follow-up questions and we're almost at an hour now. Um, do you think that that site can be cleaned up to become a wildlife refuge? Uh, the, 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 part that it's, the part that they're proposing to be a wildlife refuge, sure. Yeah. There's nothing out there. Uh, I, sort of, I sort of smile at my vision of a wildlife refuge is I see trees and grass and deer and antelope playing and rabbits running around. Well, I was out at that plant site when we took it over as a piece of raw land. And there wasn't enough livestock of living things out there other than a few crickets and field mice to, uh, and I was thinking, you're going to restore that to crickets and field mice? You know, we, we had trouble finding animals to capture and uh, uh, autopsy to uh, to set a background for uh, what was there, because there is a there is a natural radiation out there. That's a uranium. There is uranium thorium right out in that, that part of that part of the foothills in in the ground. So uh, I, I guess it's an interesting thing to do with it. Uh, 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 but I think it's sort of, from my standpoint of what I saw it in the beginning, it's sort of humorous. Okay, we have a minute, so um, okay. I'll just ask you this. Best and worst things about working there, and then we'll just wrap up from there. Uh, the best thing about working there were the people. Uh, I, I had the opportunity to work with some of the most amazing, exciting, fun people that uh, I ever worked with anywhere in Dow. The best I ever saw. The uh, hard part about working there, uh, not being able to get your story out, not being able to to be able to really to respond to uh, the criticisms and the untruths and the uh, stories that went on. 
been a, Hannah's been a delight talking with you. Well, thank you. I really appreciate your taking the time. Okay. okay.